Good morning, friends. We're so glad to be with you this morning, whether you're in the room or in your living room, however you come and wherever you are, we're thankful to be together and to know that God is present with us whenever we're together. And if this is your very first time with us, give us a quick hello text from your mobile device to 812-359-1799 to let us know you're here. We never want to have someone join us either in person or online without a hello and welcome from us. And to sweeten the deal just a bit, we'll make a donation to Provisions Food Bank here in Seymour just for texting us. That means that your simple hello puts food in the hands of someone who needs it. Your visit blesses someone else. How great is that? And thanks in advance for helping us reach out to others in our community. Today is a family worship Sunday at The Point, which means that we're all here together in the room, which also means that we'll get to hear the life that little ones bring to any space. We do this a few times each year because we believe opportunities to worship with all our generations is important. So if you happen to be sitting near one of our littles, welcome them to Big Church and enjoy these moments together. We're in week three of our series, Jesus and We. Individually, we are not the body of Christ, but together we are the body of Christ. And today as a body, we'll have the opportunity to take communion together. If you're joining us from home, grab some crackers and juice so you're ready. If you're here and didn't grab the communion cup with attached cracker on your way in, no worries. You can get one in the lobby now if you'd like. As a part of this series, we're learning that we can do infinitely more together than we can apart. That is why we, as a church, are committed to pointing people to Jesus and connecting with each other. We want to put tools in your hands to help you do just that. On your way into the building today, you notice several brightly colored point yard signs. On your way out, feel free to take one of those signs and place it in a prominent location in your yard or business. With Easter just around the corner, we know that people are more receptive to an invitation to church. A yard sign gives you the opportunity to extend an invitation to countless people you've never even met. If you're online today, stop by the church anytime during the week and pick out your favorite color. No home should be without one. Not only are we pointing people to Jesus, we are deliberately connecting people with each other. If you're ready to connect with others and take the next step in your spiritual journey, then Rooted is for you. Today is the last day to sign up for this 11-week small group experience that begins in two weeks on April 3rd. Take the next step to connect with God, the church, and your purpose through Rooted. Sign up on the church website or app today. As a church body, we have so much to give thanks for, friends. We celebrate all that God has done and is doing here at The Point and through the people of The Point. Thank you for being a part of God's work. Interested in investing in what God is doing? Here's a quick reminder of the ways you can give at The Point. One, online on the website at gotothepoint.com. Two, text The Point Give on your mobile device to 888-364-4483. Mail a check to 311 Meyer Street here in Seymour. And for those on site, place your gift in the boxes on the wall as you exit the worship center. Thank you for your partnership in the work God has given us here. Now, let's turn our gratitude to God into singing as we lift our voices together. worship him today. Come all you weary, come all you thirsty, come to the well that never runs dry. Drink of the water, come and thirst no more. Yeah. Oh, come all you sinners, come find his mercy, come to the table, he will satisfy. Oh, all right, church, come on. Oh, God. 
often we hear people talk about Jesus and me. Instead of Jesus and me, we believe God wants us to focus on Jesus and we. None of us are the body of Christ on our own. We are the body of Christ. And we can definitely be more together than we can apart. That is why we as a church are committed to point people to Jesus and connect with each other. We will be present. We will listen and work to connect with people where they are. We will give generously and demonstrate uncommon generosity with our time and resources. We are for Seymour and we will continue to invest in our community and the surrounding area. We will keep it simple. We are who we say we are. There are no hidden agendas or gimmicks on our genuine love for people. We will make it easy for families as we create space and community where families can thrive, where marriages are cultivated and where kids are cherished and nurtured. We are spiritual contributors, not spiritual consumers. The church does not exist for us. We are the church and we exist for the world. I am fully convinced that Jesus and we can make this happen. We know that love gives. Love gives. We know that love gives because God first loved us and he gave his son so that we could live eternally with him. And we should thank God for that every day. That is a wonderful blessing. And that's why we as believers, we want to give generously and demonstrate uncommon generosity with our time and our resources every day. I hope that's true for all of us individually. And I can assure you that's what we intend to do as a church. I want to say welcome to all of you here in the room and those of you who are joining us online as we enter into week three of Jesus and we. So often we talk about in Christianity this whole idea about Jesus and me and Jesus and me, it's a good thing. We hope everybody will have a close personal relationship with Jesus Christ, but we also understand the importance of having a shared relationship with Jesus as well. And that's the basis behind the title of this series, Jesus and We. We've been focusing on what happens when believers come together with several shared values. And uh, there's certainly something powerful that happens when believers do assemble together as the body of Christ. Um, these shared values help create a healthy culture in the church. And in the first couple of weeks, we've talked about serving and we've talked about faith. And these are important values in our lives and in the life of the church. We understand that we have been called to be spiritual contributors and we will not be content as a church family to be spiritual consumers. We know that the church does not exist for us. We are the church and we exist for the world. Uh, last Sunday, we talked about what it means to live a life of faith. And I shared uh, three important principles that if you didn't get them then, I, I'd encourage you to jot these down. We talked about the fact that you can't play it safe and please God. Secondly, that faith does not come with a guarantee. It's about trust. And then thirdly, you'll have to release your security to hold on to your destiny. Then we took a look at a couple of stories from the Gospels where the Bible says that Jesus was amazed. And in both cases, the thing that amazed Jesus was the size of people's faith. In one instance, uh, he was amazed by their lack of faith, and then another, he was amazed by a Roman centurion's great faith. Um, I hope we want to be the kind of people, the, the kind of church that amazes God with great big faith in him. Uh, last Sunday, I also shared some important plans regarding the future of the church, and, and uh, it's when I announced the initiation of a transition plan that will take place here at the point over the next several months. And then uh, Wednesday night, I posted a Facebook Live video message on my uh, personal page, um, and you can go there and find out more about it. Um, I do want to say this. I've had several conversations about last Sunday, to say the least, and as I've had those conversations, it's been surprising to me, to be quite honest. Uh, sometimes with people I've never met, sometimes people outside the church, sometimes people inside the church. But several have said to me, so what's really going on? You know, what's the real story? And I think, well, number one, if you've known me very long, you'd know there is no other story. That's the story. And uh, number two, it'll take some time for that to percolate. But it, the sad thing to me is it points to the fact that so many have seen some sad and unfortunate circumstances over the years where there was more to the story and there was an undercurrent and there were shadows and there were doubts and there were questions. 
And uh, this is strictly a matter of the Lord dealing with my heart, dealing with Lori and me about taking a step of faith. I believe it has to do with the future of the church. It has to do with our future lives and ministry. And there's no hidden agenda. Those, there's no secrets. There's no shadows. There's no more to the story. It's not like we're going to find out later. Oh, that's, there's none of that. It's just, hey, God's called us to begin this transition plan that he led us to put in place, and it's earlier than we expected, but we're trusting him. We're trusting him with the future of the church. We're trusting him with our future. People say, what are you going to do? I don't know, and that's true. And I, I won't say I don't have any idea because I do have ideas. People will share with me, hey, you could do this, you could do that. And I mean, I know what I, things that I could do, but I, I have no idea where the Lord's going to lead us. We don't know what that means, what it's going to look like. Um, for instance, one thing came up just this past week from a friend uh, I didn't, hadn't thought of it myself and, uh, you know, the possibilities. I mean, I'm, we're just saying the possibilities are endless for us as a church body, as a, a family. But I heard that the Colts are looking for a quarterback. So <laughs> I'm just kind of, I'm trying to be open to whatever the Lord wants to do uh, in our lives. But um, there's, no, there's no more to the story. That's the story. And uh, it's going to be exciting to see how it unfolds over the next few weeks. And you'll be hearing more about that as we start talking about focus groups that will be assembling on the weekend of uh, Palm Sunday, April 9th and 10th, and other things along the way. And so be watching for that. And thanks for your prayers for the church, our leaders, for our district superintendent, for our consulting team, for, for Lori and me as we look to the future that God has in store. Uh, not, none of us are saying that we've got any of these values mastered, uh, you know, faith and serving or anything else that we're going to talk about. It's a work in progress as we continue growing and becoming the people in the church that God is calling us to be. So today we're going to shift our focus over to the important matter of generosity. And um, in Acts chapter 20, verse 35, this is what Jesus had to say about generosity. He said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Some of you might have thought your grandmother thought of that. Some of you thought it might have been an old proverb or a saying or whatever. But Jesus is the one who said it's more blessed to give than to receive. Generosity is about giving. It is about sharing with others. I think most of us know what generosity is, but most of us are not naturally generous if we're honest. And that's because generosity is learned behavior. Generosity is learned behavior. We're not born generous. None of us have ever met a generous baby. Uh, you know, our parents uh, understand the importance of teaching their kids early how to be generous and teaching them, share with your brother, share with your sister. We want them to, to learn the value of generosity. We celebrate them when we see them starting to get it right. And even as teenagers and adults, we still need to work at strengthening our generosity muscle because the tendency is, if we're not careful, we drift back toward Selfishness, that's what happens. In his book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, author Stephen Covey talked about the difference between a scarcity mindset and an abundance mindset. Someone with a scarcity mindset, they have a hard time being generous because they believe there's simply not enough to go around. There's not enough for everybody. You've got to grab onto what you can and hold on to it because there's not enough for everybody. And so on the other hand, somebody with an abundance mindset, they always believe there, there's enough. There's more. There's always something more. Kind of imagine it like this. Let's say I had a cherry pie and, and if you cut that pie in half and take half of my pie, a scarcity mindset says there's not enough. Can't do that. I've got to hold on to what's mine. But an abundance mindset says you can have half. And if you need more, we'll make another one. There's enough for both of us. We'll find another pie. We'll go buy another pie, whatever the case. See, people with a scarcity mindset, they're afraid to give. People who live like that, they're afraid to give. And yet God has promised blessings to those who are generous. One of my favorite verses about this topic is over in Luke chapter 6, verse 38, where it says, give, and then when you do, it's going to be given back to you. Not only is it given back to you, but look how it's given. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it'll be measured to you. I always think of this verse. I don't know why. I don't know if I heard somebody explain it like this. But I always think of flour, you know, like cooking flour. You, I'm going to give you a little bowl of flour. And then, you're, you know, when I get back, it's going to come back to me. But it's not just the little bowl of flour. It's pressed down, shaken together, and running over. You know, can you imagine how much more flour there is? But that's the promise God's giving us uh, when we give. 
I love how it comes across in the paraphrase called the message, the same verse, uh, a modern day paraphrase. It says, give away your life. You'll find life given back, but not merely given back, given back with bonus and blessing. Giving, not getting is the way. Generosity begets generosity. I love that line, generosity begets generosity. Now, I suspect most of us would say we believe God's people should be generous. If you've been around here the last couple of weeks, each week in this series, I'm asking everybody to rate yourself when it comes to the matter we're talking about, serving faith. Well, we want to do it again today, and this time for generosity. We've got our scale, 1 to 10, and I don't want you to share your answer with anybody else, but I want you to be honest and look at that scale and say, hey, where am I on the scale? Am I truly a generous person? But before you put something down, I want to talk to you about it like we've been doing. We said, you know, Jesus gets a 10. He's the most generous that ever lived. He gave his life for us. And then uh, we would take it back to the left-hand side, number one. That's the devil. The devil gets a one. And so you and I are somewhere between two and nine, okay? The devil's one, Jesus is 10, two and nine. Where do you fit in? Now, I would say you're at least a two if you opened the door for somebody or if you allowed somebody to pull out in traffic or did anything nice for somebody this last week or two. I have to admit it was about a month ago, <clears throat> there was a line of uh, traffic, long line of traffic on Tipton, both the lanes were bumper to bumper and, and uh, we were sitting still and, and we were getting ready to move and somebody was waiting to pull out a pointers, parking lot and uh, pull into traffic. And so since there was so much traffic, I knew they're gonna be sitting there for a while. And so I you know, motioned for them to go ahead and pull in. And, and maybe it was selfish of me. I was doing the golden rule kind of thing, doing unto others as you'd have them do unto you. I was thinking if I'm sitting there, I'd be glad if somebody said, hey, yeah, pull out. And so that's what I did. And as they were pulling out, I realized it was somebody from church. And uh, later in the day, this person texted me to say thank you, and they were curious if I'd recognized them. Well, I didn't recognize them when they were pulling out until they were, you know, halfway out. You know, when I first said come out, I didn't know who it was, and then I noticed them, and um, I texted back to say I'm glad I was acting like a Christian whenever I see somebody from church out in the community. I mean, that always makes me feel good, you know. Always terrible to be acting like a jerk and then find, oh, they're from the church. (laughs) Let's try to do better next time, you know. Nothing like having people going down the highway on Sunday morning exchanging gestures to one another and then get to church and be sitting there and say, that's the guy, the the pastor, you know. But uh, thankfully, I was doing the Christian thing that day. It was a good day, so at least I get a two, hopefully, out of that. And uh, that person's here, and he knows who he is, so... I'm asking you, have you done anything generous? Um, You know, where are you on this scale, you know, today? Uh, I guess I get to be at least a two, but where where do you fit into that program? And, And I want you to be honest about your assessment because I think sometimes we consider ourselves generous all because of a generous act that we did once upon a time. We did something generous, so now we are perceiving ourselves as generous people. I'm not asking if you've ever done anything generous. I'm asking if you are generous. Have you been generous in this past week or so? There there are plenty of ways to be generous. You can be generous with your words, with your time, with your money, possessions, influence, attention, whatever. Probably one of the easiest ways to evaluate our, our generosities with our money. But even that can be so subjective, can't it? I mean, what's generous for one may not be generous for somebody else. You may have a lot and give a little, and it may seem like you're being generous because you have given so much, but it's a little for you. And somebody else with so little gives so much, and it may not seem like much, but you get the picture, it's kind of subjective. So if you're generous in the giving of your time and you're selflessly serving other people and you look for creative ways to give, or maybe even if you have a a giving budget, then you might give yourself a seven or an eight or a nine over there on the scale. But on the other hand, if you struggle with scarcity and if you're upset even that we're talking about this in church and maybe even think, man, if I'd have known it was this, I wouldn't have come today, then you probably need to give yourself a two, a three, or a four, maybe maybe a five uh, as you rate yourself on that scale. As followers of Jesus, shouldn't we be looking for ways to be generous, folks? I mean, shouldn't that be our goal? I mean, you don't even have to be a believer to be generous. I mean, we all know non-believers who are generous people. But if you're a Christian, don't you want to begin to be generous with what God has entrusted to you? 
Scripture clearly teaches that's what he wants from us. The Apostle Paul was writing from Macedonia to the churches in Corinth, and he was writing to encourage the Corinthian believers with news about the generosity of these churches over in Macedonia. The churches in Macedonia, Philippi, Thessalonica, and Berea, they'd given money to the impoverished believers in Jerusalem. And so um, even though these churches were poor, they wanted to make a difference, and they had sacrificially given far more than Paul even expected that they would give. And uh, surprisingly, that's what happens more often than you might think. Statistics reveal that the less people have, you know, the, the, the people with less, they're often more generous than the people who have much more. It seems to be what's happening here. The Macedonian Christians, they, they found joy in helping others, and, and they understood that generosity is simply the right thing and the good thing to do, and that's what they were doing. And so even though they were living in deep poverty themselves, they were incredibly generous with others. This is what Paul writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, beginning at verse 1. He says, now I want you to know, dear brothers and sisters, what God in his kindness has done through the churches in Macedonia. They are being tested by many troubles, and they are very poor. But they are also filled with abundant joy, which has overflowed in rich generosity. I love that. For I can testify that they gave not only what they could afford, but far more. They gave not only what they could afford, but they gave far more. One translation says they gave beyond their ability. Let me ask you a question. When was the last time you gave as much as you were able or even more? Have you ever given beyond your ability? I mean, it's a convicting question for most of us. They were giving, and their giving was rooted in generosity. It was not forced. It was not coerced in any way. Continuing reading in 1 Corinthians 8, uh, verse 3, they, they did it of their own free will. And look at this. They begged us again and again for the privilege of sharing in the gift for the believers in Jerusalem. Paul said they did it entirely on their own. These Macedonian believers, they were begging for the privilege and the opportunity to give and to share in the needs of others. Remember, they had their own needs. He described them as very poor. There were plenty of people who had more to give. Uh, it would have been easy to make a case for why these Macedonians shouldn't give at all. They were living in poverty themselves, but they wanted to give. They wanted to further the mission of God. And they urgently pleaded for the privilege of being able to give. How different is that than the attitude of so many today? I mean, so many ministries and churches and nonprofits and charities are constantly looking for incentives and gimmicks to try to motivate people to give. How different is that from a very poor group of people begging, begging for the honor of being able to give to further the mission of the gospel of Jesus Christ? They urgently pleaded for the opportunity to give, and their giving exceeded Paul's expectations. I love this next verse. It's in verse 5 where we've been reading. They even did more than we had hoped, for their first action was to give themselves to the Lord and to us just as God wanted them to. You notice what they gave first? The first action was to give themselves to the Lord. That's where generosity really begins. Generosity begins when we give ourselves completely to the Lord. Um, that's a powerful statement. Paul goes on in verse 7. He says, since you excel in so many ways in your faith, your gifted speakers, these are characteristics and qualities in the church. Your gifted speakers, your knowledge, your enthusiasm, your love for us, from us. I want you to excel also in this gracious act of giving. What would that take for you to excel in the gracious act of giving? I think generosity is a desirable value and a trait that we all want to possess, don't we? And I'm thankful for a church and for so many people who understand the value of caring for the needs of others. One of the greatest expressions of generosity at the point is found in things like the RIP medical debt offering that we did a couple of years ago and our ongoing desire to provide clean water for those who need it through Team World Vision. I was blessed to receive this impact report a few days ago, and some of you might have seen my post that I put out on Facebook about it. This report is a symbol of generosity. 
From 2016 to 2021, $408,000 in funds donated, uh, 185 children sponsored, 4,268 people received clean water. I mean, lots and lots of great things on that report to celebrate. And then that's not only to say, hey, we've got hundreds of people that have been generous with their prayers and dollars. But in addition to that, there were 179 people who have sacrificially and generously given of their time, their energy, their influence, and so much more because that's how many people have participated on Team World Vision since 2016, 179 people. See, as followers of Jesus, we want to give generously and demonstrate uncommon generosity to others. Why would we do it? We would do it because it's right and because it's good. And it's consistent with the example of our Heavenly Father who who has been and who is so generous to all of us. We do it because we're challenged to a better way of life in the Word of God. That's what Paul was talking about when he wrote to young Timothy over in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse, or 6, I'm sorry, 1 Timothy 6, 17, 18, and 19. He said, Timothy, command those who are rich in this present world, which if you measure it by the standards of today, we are all in that boat. We are all rich in this present world, not to be arrogant or to put their hope in wealth, which I hope you know better than that, which is so uncertain, we're figuring that out, but to put their hope in God who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. He's our source. He goes on, command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of that life, which is truly life. See, we truly do believe the words of Jesus. It is more blessed to give than receive. I want you to see a story right now that illustrates that point so incredibly well. Take a look. I always opened at Domino's here uh, every Sunday. It was my long day and, you know, just come in and my manager let me know, hey, we already got two future time orders for, you know, right as we open. I'm like, all right, cool. And so there's like one's, uh, you know, going to the point, whether well, it's cross town. I was like, all right, well, I'll take this church one. When I got here, you know, I was greeted um, by, uh, by a lady. Automatically, they give me a $10 bill and they're like, hey, can you wait? Uh, they'd like for you to uh, deliver out while they're doing the sermon. I said, yeah, I can wait. That's fine. Shouldn't take too long. And, you know, come up here. And I was asked, you know, what was the biggest tip that I had got? $20 bill with a $20 tip. All right. He's like, well, I think we can do better than that. And uh, they brought out the, you know, the empty pizza box and counted them out, you know, $50. They invited a congregation to come up and uh, donate to uh, my Christmas blessing. At that point, you know, I was covering up my face, you know, trying not to cry and, you know, because, I mean, almost everybody Everybody stood up. I did not expect that at all on uh, on just you know a regular Sunday going to work. I had no idea how much it even was or you know was going to be. I figured you know hey I got like four hundred dollars. First thing I wanted to do was you know call my mom. I was in church that Sunday morning. Um, we were kind of finishing up our um, our morning worship. She called me while she was um, after she had done one of her runs. I sent a message. I'll call you back in just a minute. Well, she called again. I sent her another, I'll be call you right back. We're finishing up. And then she called again. I was like, okay, something's wrong. So I called her, called her back. I, I stepped away for a minute and I said, what's going on? And she said, you're not going to believe what happened. She started telling me the story of getting a call for the delivery for a pizza over to the point. She said, well, they brought me up front. I said, okay. And then they started giving me money. I said, okay. I said, so you got a pretty good tip. She said, Mom, I've got at least $300 in this pizza box. I said, somebody's listening. I said, somebody knew that you needed to hear this today. You needed to know that somebody's watching you. Somebody has got your back and is watching over you with all of this going on. As a mom, you you always want the best for your kids. And you always, you hope that they're going to grow up and walk on the straight and narrow. But what you hope to happen is that when they do fall, that there is somebody there that's going to pick them up and have that hand down to bring them out 
of, of that darkness. And that happened in um, December of 2019. Within a few weeks of that, you could start to see kind of a change. I didn't realize it, but then she started on her path to sobriety. And her anniversary, her clean date is January 10th, 2020. And she, um, she now has two years and a couple months clean. It was so needed. Um, I mean, I had just moved into a house by myself with my son, was literally thinking a couple days before, you know, I don't know how I'm gonna do Christmas. I don't know how I'm gonna just get on, get on track of everything. So that definitely helped for Christmas and I got a lot of my bills paid ahead, you know, a couple months so I didn't have to worry about it. Coming out of the situation that I was in, I was in a very abusive situation and, you know, trying to gather myself and my family and feel safe again. Going off of that, it, it was a tremendous, tremendous blessing of, you know, I can, I can do this now. <laughs> if I'm gonna, you know, do this thing, I gotta do it right. And I can't be strung out even to the point of being dead. You know, it's, it wasn't worth it. And it really, you know, it turned it around of a new light that it is sobriety is possible no matter what point you're at with it. It doesn't matter if you're, you know, 10 years in on an addiction or three weeks. I mean, if you have the power to stop, it's gonna be hard, it's gonna suck, but once you get over that hill, it's nothing, nothing but light. You know, my newest tattoo, uh, the, the awareness ribbons for breaking the chains of addiction, you know, finally, got through that point of my life and finally free of those chains. And that one meant, that one meant a lot to me as well. I ended up with uh, 1678, 1678 from uh, the church. Just a thing of don't think about it. If you are in the situation where you're able to help somebody, there's really no harm in helping them. And you know, the little things in, can really turn everything around. Just one decision can get you on a whole other path. Did you hear what she said? Even the little things can turn everything around. I believe that's true. Even the little things can turn everything around. In your notes, even a small gesture of generosity can make a big difference in the life of somebody else. Love what it says over in Isaiah 32a, generous people plan to do what's generous and they stand firm in their generosity. They plan to do what's generous. They stand firm in their generosity. They're strategic and intentional, intentional about their giving. They have a plan to do it. Have you ever developed a plan for a major purchase? I mean, you think about the purchase that you wanna make and you research it and you study it and you save up and then one day you do it. A generous person does the same thing with their giving. They plan on how they can be more generous. Stingy people do the same thing. They have a plan too. They have a plan that they uh, want to hold on and hoard and keep what all they have, and so they have a plan to do that. When all culture says consume, 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 a generous person plans to do what's generous. And Paul told the Corinthians how to plan their giving over in 1 Corinthians 16 too. He said, on the first day of the week, you should put aside a portion of the money that you've earned. It's his way of saying, make it a priority. Do it on the first day of the week. Set aside a portion. Pick a percentage. Do, do something on purpose. Pick a percentage. Make it a priority. Do it on purpose each week. And that's what I want to encourage you to do today. Understand, generosity is not just what we do. It's who we are. It's who we're to be as Christians. And generosity is not just something we do occasionally. It becomes a habit. It becomes a pattern. It becomes a practice in our daily lives. We challenge people to become on purpose, priority percentage givers around here. Lori and I have chosen to tithe our entire married lives. We were both doing that before we were together and we've done it ever since as, as a family. And, and that means we give 10% of our increase. That's our baseline for giving. If you've never tithed, I wanna encourage you to consider beginning that journey here today. 
The Point has a 90-day tithe challenge, and uh, there's a QR code. I don't know how this works, but you can scan this from anywhere in the room. You can scan it if you're watching online. Just scan the screen. It'll take you to this tithe challenge, which basically says, hey, for 90 days, I'm going to give tithing a try. I'm just going to try it out and see how it works. And the Bible says, bring the whole tithe in the storehouse and see if I'll not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing you'll not have room enough for it. Um, we say, hey, do it for 90 days, the 10 percent thing and just see how that works out. And if at the end of 90 days you say, boy, that was a mistake. I blew it. I shouldn't have done that. Let us know. We'll give you your money back. How do you get off of any better than that? That's a chance. Do it. Now you say, well, Steve, I, that sounds good, but I can't do that. See, I get it. You may say, you know, I want to be generous, but I can't tithe. So I'm just going to stay where I am. Don't do that. Decide today you're going to do something. Pick a percentage. 2%, 1%, 5%. I don't care. Start somewhere today to decide I'm going to become an on-purpose percentage priority giver and I'm going to do it on a regular basis because I have a, a plan. See, remember, we have to learn to be generous with others. It typically does not come naturally. And if you're not a generous person, I want to encourage you the way to get out of your greed, which if you're not generous, you're greedy. The way to get out of your greed is to exercise your way out by giving. That's the way you do it. We know that God doesn't want us to give grudgingly, but cheerfully, generously, and from a heart of love for others. And I'm telling you right now, folks, generosity is a choice. And it is a decision that every single one of us can make. And so I invite you to give consideration to starting somewhere. If you say, well, Steve, I'm not going to tithe. Okay, okay. Start somewhere. Do something to take the next step in your generosity journey. The Lord gave so generously for us. We're gonna take a few moments and we're gonna pray and then we're gonna receive the elements of communion. And as we do that, I just wanna invite you to think about what is the Lord speaking to me about this important matter of generosity? Would you bow with me please as we pray? Father, I thank you for our church family. I thank you for so many expressions of generosity down through the years that have made a difference in the lives of so many. But it's not just made a difference in the lives of the recipients. It has made a difference in the lives of the donors as well. And uh, Lord, we want to follow your example. And I believe that you're speaking to some today about taking their next step, whatever that looks like. Some are, have been tithing and giving above that, and you're challenging them maybe to take another step and go further. Some are going to say, today is the day I'm going to start. I'm going to give it a try and see what the next 90 days holds. Others may say, I'm not ready to do that, but I'm going to start somewhere. I'm going to choose a percentage. I'm going to make it a priority. I'm going to do it on a regular basis, and I'm just going to try to stretch that faith muscle just a little bit. I'm going to stretch that generosity muscle just a little bit. I'm going to get out of this greed thing. I've been making excuses and saying I'm going to do it for years, but today, Lord, I believe some decisions will be made that will make a difference for the rest of our lives. And so give us the wisdom to know what do we do with what we've heard today. today. Uh, how do we respond to what your spirit is speaking to each one of us? May your will be done, I pray, in all of our lives. Give us the courage to do it. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, as you came in, I hope that you received the elements of communion. Today, uh, we are going to receive these elements as an expression of our gratitude to God for the generosity that he has shown to us. And so sometimes... Uh, sometime through this next song that Danelle is going to sing, I want to encourage you to just, in gratitude, take the bread which represents the body of Jesus which was broken for you. And drink the juice which represents Christ's shed blood. This incredible gift that he's given us. The song says, he gives me everything. He's given us life and health and he's given us this opportunity to be together today. He's given us so much. And so as we receive these elements, we do so in gratitude, thanking God for the generosity that has been expressed to us each and every one. I want to encourage you to receive these elements just sometime during this next song when you feel ready in your heart to do so. And as you do it, say a prayer of thanks to God for the generosity that he has shown to you. God bless you.
push and pull at your command so you can still my heart with your hand you tell the seasons when it's time for them to turn so I will trust you even when it hurts you
Praise the Lord. I'm so thankful this morning for his goodness. I'm so thankful this morning for God's generosity to me. Somebody said, how high is your vertical leap? I said, I have no idea. I just get a little bit excited about the things of God. Somebody said, why is that? Because he picked me up and he turned me around and he placed my feet on solid ground. So church, I thank the master and I thank my savior. I thank God today because he supplies every need, even my need for salvation. He is supplied. So as we leave this place and we've been challenged by our pastor to live generous lives. I love that verse and that message translation because it says, give your life away. May we this week do just that. May we give our lives away. When we come in contact with people, may we share joy. When we come across someone, may we speak words of life. If God calls us to give, may we give open-handedly and joyfully and cheerfully. As we are challenged today, Jesus and we, to give our lives away, to be a generous people. So may you go in his grace and may you go in his peace today, knowing that your God gives you everything that you have and he gives you everything that you need. Go in his grace and in his peace today. Thank you for worshiping with us today, church.